John, how's it going? Doing great. Thanks for having me out, Matt. You're in the belly of the beast now, Washington, D.C. Does it feel different than Minneapolis? Not yet. Um, it, it is kind of fun to be back. I, I lived out here a, a number of years ago, so, and I haven't been back in probably, oh, it's been a decade and a half, I think. But it's, it's fun to be out here. So you guys at the Foundation for Economic Education have been quite heroic in, in producing content during the pandemic, uh, particularly looking at it from an economic lens. And you're you're just like a, a font of productivity. Um, how does that happen? Like I like how do you produce so much stuff? You know, like you know, we have a good team of people, and and you know, I think the real challenge for us last year was like, okay, how do we cover this? Um, when you look at the pandemic, in, in a lot of ways, it was like a topic meant for fee. Um, you have this this fear um, that you know everybody was terrified, and and government became the solution right away. Um, and we looked at it and said, well, there, there's going to be problems with this. Um, but how do you how do you cover it? Um, and we had some internal conversations about it. And um, I think nobody really knew at first, like, how do we how do we push back on these things, you know, that, that, that are happening? Um, you know, we don't um, you know, will we get shut down? Like, what can we say? What can't we say? Um, but we staked out ground early on that said, no, we, got, we have to find our, our, vo- our voice on this. And we just started, you know, just poking at, at some of these topics right away and, and, and looking at history, you know, previous panics that broke out and showing that, that government, you know, wasn't the solution um, to these problems. And we kind of evolved as we did it. And, you know, at, as the pandemic evolved, for, it started with lockdowns, right? Um, but lockdowns, are, you know, hopefully, are ancient history now. I think the, the, their record speaks for themselves. Um, although it'll take a few years, I think, for everybody Supposedly to do that. Supposedly, even Australia is backing off. Yeah, no, that's, that's I actually hadn't seen that. Um, you know, I, I was looking more, mostly here in our country, but yeah, other parts of the world, like there are, like you know, Australia is the example, right? It is, it's intense, it's crazy, um, it's just flat out Orwellian, and a lot of people see that. And I think the good thing is, even here in the States, I don't think there's many people looking at Australia and saying, oh, that's what we need to be doing. Um, well, even progressives not, over yeah. here, like they're they're really um, pretty mum on Australia. They kind of just want to pretend it's not happening. Um, but it shows where these, where these you know, ideas can go if we let them go there. A total sidebar, but I just got back from Italy. Uh, my wife and I went there for our anniversary, and we ended up randomly just talking to people, all of whom were surely... Uh, very left of center, but they, but they were particularly angry about vaccine mandates. And, um, you know, one, one young woman kept saying, this is supposed to be a democracy, and yet they're forcing us to do this. And it's interesting that the, the almost meaningless use of the word democracy in that context, but um, she thought it was a fundamental violation of, of her rights and particularly um, workers that were working outside, in this case, picking grapes, and they and they weren't allowed to because they weren't vaccinated. So I think I feel like there's there is a counter revolution percolating um, if we keep pushing there. You know, if you look in in Europe right now, like there are like all these mass protests, and you would have I think most Americans have no idea they're getting very little media coverage, but people are out in mass, uh, and and they're, and they're opposed to them. Like I I don't know if you poll people what. What you know, the favorability is in Italy or, or uh, France or whatever, but there are a lot of people that are upset by them. They see them as a, a violation of uh, you know bodily aut- autonomy, which they are. Um, and you know, it's that it's it's kind of you know trying to navigate the fine line. Are is the are the vaccines bad or is it just the vaccine mandates that are bad? Um, you know, I had COVID in March. It was no picnic, you know. And like I, I've I've said, like knowing what I know today. I, I would I would get a vaccine if it would help me not. I was down for like a week. I was pro- probably the sickest I've ever been. And if a vaccine would you know if a vaccine would would make that you know twenty four hours of body aches instead, you know to me that's that's good. But other people you know point we, we don't know long term effects. There, there could be things like that. Um, but I think that the the best solution is let people decide. Like yeah. this is people need to make up their minds for themselves. That's crazy talk. That's yeah. crazy talk. Not not to spoil your theory, but I got vaccinated after going like 14 months without being vaccinated. And then I got COVID and it might last more than a week, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like a life threatening situation. I just felt like crap. So it's, but it gets back to like, if there are long-term consequences of being vaccinated, 
it is it is fundamentally evil to have been forced by someone else to make that choice, um, particularly when it comes to children. And and I thought this would be common sense, but apparently that's a controversial thing to say. Yeah, no, it, it, vaccinating kids is insane to me. Like my daughter had COVID a, a few weeks ago and she had a sniffle and, and a fever for one night and a few body aches and was out on the trampoline, you know, shortly after that plane. Um, and I, I think that's the experience that the vast majority of kids are going to have, or if, if, if not less. Um, and so like, you know, everybody has their own choice in how they want to approach it as parents. Um, you know, like for me, like I, I'm, my kids won't be taking the, a vaccine. Like, I don't care if what that means. Like if we have to move to a different school, I, I don't, you know, for, for my kids don't, don't need this. Other people feel differently. That's okay. Um, you know, but I think, look, you know, there's risk in everything we do. Right. But if you look, you know, I saw I, from a guy on Twitter, I follow Phil Kirpin. You probably know him. He's really good. Um, he runs an institute, I think, out here. But it was just a breakdown of data uh, for children on, on cause of death, you know, going back to March of last year. And COVID counts for less than 1%. Um, there's a lot of risks that children face. COVID is, is way down the list of uh, on that list. Um, so, you know, people need to, de- to decide. But um, th- this idea that we, we can force parents to, to, you know, what kids are going to have in their body, I, I think is absolutely insane. And I think it, it, if, if they go down that road, that's crossing the Rubicon. Like there are there are parents that that'll just say, nope, enough. And they're going to give up on whether it's L.A. school district trying it or, or wherever it is. They're, they're going to they're going to say, uh, hell no, we're not, we're not going to do this. Well, you'll you'll be labeled by the Justice Department as a domestic terrorist yeah. if you try to assert your right as a parent. It's really surreal, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, like it, it, it's, um, but yeah, it, it, hopefully, I, I, I think um, we're seeing businesses push back on these a little bit more now too, like some of the airlines. Um, I think they're, you know, in, in how the, the, the Biden administration actually has goes about this, you know, I think it was Jeffrey Tucker had a great point at the Brownstone Institute, an organization I think he founded recently. Um, you really can't find an order anywhere, right? To, to say like, what is this? Like, it's it's all word of mouth yeah. right now. It, it's all like the, what, what what the administration is telling companies, but you can't physically go and find a document that says this. And to me, that's crazy. Yeah, um, it's kind of banana republic stuff. Yeah, it's like it's, like a, it's, a, it's an offer you can't refuse. And, yeah, and it it does it does put. Uh, I've, I've been pretty tough on corporations because I think a lot of them. Uh, fall in line and and perhaps want to because if they can blame the government for forcing them to do something, then they can cater to the to their uh, the Karens in their customer base. Um, but it's 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 also like a dilemma if you ignore what Fauci said on Meet the Press yesterday, and it might be different than what he said the week before. But if you ignore that, that surely opens you up to to liability and lawsuits if if you proceed forward. So it's. It's kind of a it's a it's an impossible situation for businesses to put to be, to be in, and Thomas Massey pointed out on this show that he didn't he didn't think the Biden administration was ever going to go through with the vaccine mandate. They were just saying it, hoping to bully everybody, all these corporations into doing it. And by the way, making the businesses the bad guys instead of the government. Does he still hold that view? Yeah, like okay. it, th- those those rules are not out yet, yeah. right? No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I didn't know if that was something that um, there's developments that said, no, like they're actually going through that. I think you're right. I, I think right now this is putting a ton of pressure on, on corporations to do the dirty work for the government. Um, I think they know that there's like, you know, people you'll see a lot of articles saying, oh, the legal precedent for vaccine mandates, um, all the precedents. Well, if you look, all those precedents are at the state and local level. Nothing like this has ever been tried at the federal level. And shortly before um, Biden announced this campaign, you know, Lawrence Gostin is, is a um, celebrated, you know, uh, public health official. He he um, uh, I think he I'm trying to remember if it's at Georgetown, but uh, he, you know, is part of the World Health Organization, runs a, a big you know, part of their operations. And he said shortly before this, he said, I just want to make clear and I'm paraphrasing, not quoting. But the Biden administration doesn't have the authority to, to do this. And he said, this has always been done at state, local levels. Well, we see the announcement come out a few days later. And I wrote a piece about this. And it's, there's, there's really no precedent for the federal government um, doing some sort of vaccination order like this. And I, you know, like we know their legal authorization, right? Like their OSHA and, and so forth. Um, I think, you know, I'm not a constitutional scholar. Um, take, you know, so, 
take my opinion for what it's worth, but I think the courts will eviscerate any attempt for the federal government to force this yeah. on businesses or individuals. The, the problem is a lag time, and we saw this with the CDC and the, the moratorium on um, prohibiting the collection of rent. Um, it was clearly unconstitutional, and, and even... Um, even with all of the dumb things that the courts do, we, we probably knew they were going to get there, but it's, it's slow walked, right? And so we had a, I don't know what it was, almost a year of, of the CDC dictating um, economic policy, and, and now you have OSHA doing the same thing. So I think that's the game that they're playing. They're going to they're gonna do this knowing full well that eventually it will be proven unconstitutional, but at that point then they can blame the courts for not, for not caring or whatever the talking point of the no, I think that analysis is pretty sound. Yeah, I, I, I think they, they'll still the, you know, look at it as the politics. Well, they can bring, blame the Supreme Court if that does happen. Um, and, you know, a friend of mine who's kind of in, in political circles, he, you know, uh, he, he's convinced all of this stuff is just happening because it keeps people from fo- you know, talking about the economy. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're focused still on vaccine mandates and all this other stuff, you're not talking about hyperinflation. You're not top, talking about um, a, a labor shortage of historic proportions in these things. I'm I, I hate to be that cynical, but, you know, like there, there might be something to that, too. Like at least they're not focusing on some of these other you know economic issues that are um, really polling poorly. It's kind of it's kind of like manipulative politics 101 that you're going to divide us so that we're fighting against each other and. And we've seen this a thousand iterations of this. Um, let's let's call it a culture war because it divides our culture um, today between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. And and I have a friend. Uh, I won't I won't name him, but you know him as well. And his son recently got COVID, and he felt so guilty about it. He was devastated. He thought that he did something wrong because he caught a virus. And I'm like, that is that is so messed up. And that, like, not only going to screw up kids, but it allows for society to to keep dividing us between it's not just unvaccinated, but if you did get sick, you probably didn't do the things you were supposed to do. You probably didn't wear two masks or you didn't stay at home or like you, you did something sinful almost. And and there's that religiosity to it that's that's super creepy. But, yeah, like we're all fighting about that and we're all fighting about all these other culture issues um, not realizing ex- until recently, perhaps, and this is actually what I want to talk about today. Uh, people are starting to notice that there is not the things they want on store shelves, and if they are there, they're insanely expensive. And then this is all something that that you guys at Fee, we at Free the People, predicted in March of 2020. And like I, I discovered Frederick Bastiat when I went to the Foundation for Economic Education when I was a college kid. I was reading it on the plane on the way in last, last night. Yeah, and that's like the reason I like economics and, and not all economics, but, but common sense economics like Frederick Bastiat teaches it is it allows you to sort through insanely compli- complicated moments when things are radically uncertain and still be able to predict, as I did in March of 2020, we're going to have a huge supply chain crisis because it, it, it just sort of basic economics that if you prevent people from working, which lockdowns were, you remember the hashtag, stay the fuck home. And I was like, do they, do they understand what that means? If everyone actually stayed home, what would be the consequences of that? Well, of course, they didn't mean that. They meant that um, uh, the entire laptop class would stay home and certain poor bastards still had to go out there and work so that your food would come to your front door but the unknown, unseen disruptions, as Bastiat would have predicted, um, are now manifesting themselves in a, in a global crisis that is, is only going to get worse because the government's going to continue to try to fix it. Yeah. You know, I, I thought Elon Musk put it really good last year when he said, you know, he was talking to Joe Rogan, just like you and I are. And he said, this idea that you can just send people checks and everything will be OK is, is a lie, he said. If you don't produce stuff, you will not have stuff. Um, and he was way ahead of the game. And we're seeing, the, you know, the now the, the reason I think we were able to kind of slide by, you had all these stores that had just mass amounts of in, inventory. Um, but a lot of that's like gone. I, I was talking with a guy at a wine store, like we, me and my wife went out to dinner and uh, we were going to get a bottle or two. You could carry in, you know, there was no cork fee or something. So we just brought in a bottle or two of wine. 
And the guy, he was chatty. We were just talking. And he said, though, my inventory is like shot. He said, we had all of this. And he said, we, I can't get stuff anymore. And he, and, and he, had, he was talking like there was real problems. And this was a, a couple months ago. Um, and so you could see all the writing on the wall now. Now, now you're seeing like people are, you know, the, the news stories are there. You're not going to be able to get your booze on Christmas. Um, you're not going to be able to get your presents. Like, like you order presents now. Like I think that was the Kamala Harris quote. Like they're aware, like there, there's massive shortages. Um, and it was predictable. As you said, there's a million parts that go into an economy that, and most people don't see it. You don't have to worry about it. It, it, It's, it's a, it's a self operating organism that, that it just works if you, if you stay out of the way, but, um, we disrupted it and there's going to be some pain. And I think we're still in the early stage of, of, of these pains that we're going to be experiencing for some time. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of the dilemma for those of us that, that defend free markets and voluntary cooperation and, and Bastiat writes about it. I, I think the very first article I wrote for Fee was talking about this essay in Bastiat. Um, it's in Economic Sophisms. I forget which chapter, but he's talking about the, the mystery of why Paris is fed and how the entire population of the city uh, sleep well at night, just assuming that when they wake up, everything they need, what they need for breakfast and, and what they need to do their work and to heat their homes and, and the all those things that you don't even think about, um, they don't know why that happens. They don't care why that happens. All they know is that they're going to be fine. And, and we're sort of in that situation in, in reverse today. They don't, uh, people may not understand um, what is this supply chain thing? And is it like, can Joe Biden fix it just by mandating that the docks in LA um, now operate 24 hours a day? Which isn't true, by the way. Like, you know, he came in and there's a, a big press conference. said, oh, we're, we're going to be, you know, there's agreement here. We're going to be 24 seven or on the clock. Um, you know, just as a backstory, I, I wrote a piece on, on this. Um, 40% of all U.S. imports come through through dock. You know, two, two ports out on the West Coast, one Long Beach, one L.A. Um, and those, those docks don't even operate on weekends. And they're not going 24 hours. You know, so Biden was going to come in and, and try to, to fix that. Um and the next day, the very next day, the unions are like, yeah, we don't really have any timeline to do that. Yeah. You know, like, you, yeah. we, we just can't flip a switch. They, their contract, they have a contract next year. I think they're going to leverage this thing, you know, like to, and the, my whole point is like, this is one of the, the consequences of unions. Like, they're not about productivity. They're not about efficiency. Um, they're usually serving their, their own political interests. Um, but think about that. We have two ports, 40% of all imports come through there. And they're not working around the clock. And and I think, you know, Biden, you know, wanted to, does he want to fix that? Sure. But he doesn't have the power to do that. He, yeah. he can't come in, negotiate the, the contract. Um, it, and, you know, I think a lot of people now probably do believe like, oh, that issue solved. Well, well, it's not. Yeah. And it's just one of many issues in the supply chain, you know, crisis. Yeah. Like it's it's something that I never thought about before. The the brittleness of of the supply chain, in this case, due to union power. And the you know the special position they have in negotiating those contracts, which is totally out of sync with the rest of the world and the distribution of of shipping and and all that stuff. But they had the power to do it. They had the political juice to do it. And uh, even Joe Biden, their their um, savior, has no ability to to badger them into to complying with that. But. I feel like it's a double-edged sword for him because, I mean, clearly the president, regardless of who it is, and maybe regardless of what they did, is going to be held accountable for economic disruption. So he, by by going to L.A. and holding that press conference, he he now kind of owns it. And even if he had been able to fix that problem, it's just a it's just the tip of the iceberg. It's something that people notice because there's a bunch of ships uh, floating outside of L.A. Um, but he probably has no idea how to fix it. And, and that's, you know, like it's one of the things with, with media. And I'll, and I'll say this for Philo. What we got to do is look in two months from now. Are these, are, is this here yet? Um, you know, like are, are the ports working 24-7? Because you're right. You know, by, by saying like we're out here, we're getting this done, he kind of owns it. And, and my hunch is two months from now, the situation will be the same. Hopefully I'm wrong. Like I want this solved as much as everyone else. And hopefully they can get the, the unions to come and say, look, these are serious problems. We got we to step up right now. Um, so hopefully I'm wrong, but my hunch is six weeks two, you know, eight weeks from now, the, the situation will be the same. Yeah. And it's, um, 
I mean, and, and Mises talks a lot about this, uh, particularly in the context of, of the business cycle and the way that the manipulation of the money supply and the price signals um, creates a necessary adjustment. And the problem is not the adjustment. The problem is, is that politics won't allow for the adjustment to happen. And it, it turns something that could, would be painful and difficult in economic adjustment back to reality to um, devastating and creating long-term consequences. And, I, and going back to um, Bastiat on this whole thing, the, the thing that I did not anticipate, which has been perhaps the biggest piece of the disruption, was the willingness of, of the federal government to just shower money on people not to work. Flood the system with money. That was, yeah. what, you know, Jerome Powell was asked about that by Scott Pelley on 60 Minutes earlier in the year. So, so basically, he just flooded the system with money, and Jerome Powell was like, yeah, that's, that's really what we did. Um, and we're going to see that, that that's not a solution. And we're seeing these inflation numbers. You know, Brad Palumbo, my colleague, has written about that, uh, written a lot about it. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's interesting. It, it started like first, like, no, we're not going to see inflation. Well, we, okay, we are, but it's transitory. And now the conversations switch to, well, okay, it, it might not be transitory, but some inflation's okay. Yeah. And then you, you see articles now like, no, inflation's good. Here's why. Um, and, and so basically, I think they're admitting they can't, inflation's here, we can't control it. And now they're trying to, you know, their political messaging with it in, in you know, certain media outlets are, are, are trying that. Um, but no matter what anybody tells you, inflation's not good. Right. Um, and it's usually the poorest people that are harmed the most by it. And, you know, if you own a home, you know, like that's an asset that I'll appreciate. If you own stocks, like there's some people that aren't going to be as harmed by inflation. Um, it's the people on fixed incomes, um, on pensions. Uh, it, like they're the ones that are, you know, when, they, when their hamburger meat goes up, when the price of bread goes up, they're the ones that can least afford it. Um, but to your point, I think what the, the solution is always more government. They're, yeah. they're, they're always looking, oh, we just got to plan more. Uh, and it, it reminded me of an anecdote, like I, it's something I read years ago. I'm pretty sure it's between Reagan and Gorbachev. And, and Gorbachev asked Reagan, it's like, how do you get food to people? You know, how do you make sure the people are fed? And Reagan's like, I don't make sure the people are fed. And, and the, the, the lesson there is like, he just, he's not trying to control the system. Like that's what a market economy does. If you get out of the way, it works. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and Gorbachev, who is a really smart man, could not understand that he could understand how how they had all this food and how he wasn't directing it to people yeah so like the the one one example of that and i've, I've been reading up on this because i've wanted to to get into the economics of supply chain and it is infinitely complex and anyone that says they're an expert is probably um telling you a story but one small piece of that puzzle so we 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 force people to stay home they're non-essential workers they had to stay home and then we started paying them to stay home. So their consumption patterns changed and they went f uh, from, from spending the money in the service economy, they couldn't go out to eat, they couldn't do all of those things that they used to do. So they started doing things like home improvements and they started consuming lumber and lumber got really expensive. And one of the consequences of that um, artificially inflated price of lumber due to this excess demand created by government was the inability to produce pallets, which are a key part of the entire shipping industrial complex. And it's all, it's all like this incredible science, but you know, everyone's focused on containers, but no one's focused on pallets, which are built with lumber, which they can't buy anymore. And, and this, this, I'm gonna quote Bastiat like a thousand times in this conversation, but it's like, you probably weren't smart enough to know that was gonna happen, but you knew that if you, if you artificially manipulated the economy, something messed up was going to happen. And that's, that's one of a million reasons why we can't get the supply chain back online is because we've completely corrupted the marketplace. It's a great anecdote. And I hadn't heard that, that like there's an issue with a shortage of pallets. And it goes like you can't predict what you're not going to have. Um, and you can't predict that all these consequences of, of a given action. 
Um, and, and especially something is, is when we're talking, you know, 35% of the money in circulation right now is printed in the last 18 months. I say printed, but it's not all printed, of course. Like some of it's just pumping, you know, digital currency to banks um, who are holding it. But think about that, 35% of, of all, you know, dollars in production in the last 18 months. And then we're, we're surprised that you have all this wild speculation. You know, yeah. I don't know if you're into cryptos. You know, I, I invest in a few. Um, and if you've been like Shiba coin right now, has just been going through the roof. And I'm like, this is, you know, and I'm, you know, Shiba coin, I'm not sure I believe in like, there's some like I really like, you know, cryptos. That I, I think ooh, that there's value there. Um, this looks like, kind of like one of those tokens that it, it's built more like just to go through the roof right now. But as market cap, I think just crossed $50 billion. Um, and it's just going, you know, this is what happens when you flood the system with money. Um, and, and people aren't dumb to be doing this either, because if you look the savings rate, you know, right now, like we had in July, um, the lowest savings rate ever, um, when you when you factor in what you made on keeping your money in the bank, the, the, the interest rate was 0.07%. Then you factor in inflation, which means that if you just have your money in the bank, you're losing, you know, five, five and a half percent yeah. of your wealth by holding it there each year. So you need to put your money in, in places and you can you can invest in stocks. There's risk there. You can invest in land, you know, like you, to an extent. But a lot of this is like crypto. It's just a hedge against inflation. And that's why we've seen, you know, in the last couple of years, cryptos uh, explode in a way that, um even even the most bull, bullish of us didn't really predict, but it, it's it's because of what the the Federal Reserve is doing, um, in in deciding to flood this system with money to make things okay. You know, you you mentioned um, the you didn't say it this way, but the haves and have nots of uh, that are created by inflation, and and Mises talks about that as well because the 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 money doesn't land equally across the the distributed economy. It it, it has injection points. And to, to the point about hedging against inflation, um, a lot of people can't do that. They don't have the resources to do it. They don't have the time to do it. They may not have the know-how to do it. And it, it, it's fundamentally disadvantageous if you just have a savings account, right? And you've been saving your entire life to send your kids to college or something, and that money is getting eroded. But if you're Elon Musk, you can play the crypto market and you can do this and you can do that and you're you're kind of a sophisticated player you know how the world works um that that's happened again and again in this in this pandemic and it i feel like it's one of these things that that we believe who believe in freedom we're not very good at actually owning the the have versus have not thing because it is the manipulation of the market that creates these losers and it's it's inevitably not the insiders. It's not wealthy people that understand how these systems work. Yeah, no, it, it's right. It, it's the old, the Cantillon effect, right? Like the, where you have certain people that benefit more than others from inflation. It's the the, the financial institutions. They get that money first. Um, and then people that know what, you know, okay, now I got to pour into, into, into stocks. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's nothing new, but as you know, the federal reserve becomes more and more important, you see that more and more. And, and you're right, as far as income inequality go, um, we have now the top 1% hold the record amount of wealth in the U S and it, it, it's no coincidence that, that this has happened. Um, this is, this is what happens when you, when you try to run a market economy this way, when you, you, you flood it with money, you're going to have, uh, it, it's exacerbated income inequalities in ways that will, um, that are only going to get worse. And it's funny cause I saw Robert Reich making this point on, uh, Twitter yesterday, I think it was, or maybe the day before. And I responded, I said, look, this is what, this is what happens when you decide to lock down an economy and, and try to pump money. I, it was these policies that caused this. Cause he was saying, I think his point was there's a record amount of, of new billionaires, like 130 new billionaires that were rec- created in the last You're year. You're like, well, no shit. But exactly. This <laughs> yeah. is what happens. Like it's, it was great. The pandemic was great for the haves. It, it, the have nots, you know, it was a very different story. And like, I can say personally, I did well in the pandemic and I feel a little guilty about it. Like we, we have, you know, we have a home, you know, like I, we have stocks, we have four, 401ks, all these things financially, you know, we did well in the pandemic, but that doesn't make it right. Um, and these, these we, we got to be honest. And, and you and I have jobs that, that we, we weren't essential, but we didn't need to go out into the world 
to do our jobs. We're, we're, we're the Zoom workers, right? Yeah. Like we can we can work from home. My wife works, you know, like her company. She works for you know a big company, but um, she since the pandemic started, she works from home, and the, like her company decided like her whole department gets to keep working at home. We're looking at moving now. We're like, okay, like we both have jobs. We work remotely. Um, we're kind of excited. We can go maybe get in the country, buy land and stuff. Um, and for people like us, that's not bad. We work from home, but it, um, a lot of people don't have those choices um, and those options. And, and they've been crushed by this. Um, we probably know some personally, like, you know, like small business owners that they've, they poured everything into their business. And they're like, no, you're shut down. Um, and they weren't, they weren't the people getting the loans either, right? Yeah. Like so much, you, you see the people that got the, the loans, you're like, oh, uh, Hunter Biden's art gallery, you know, like the people that fund his art, they got half a million dollars or, or Joel Osteen, like the mega church guy got a ton, a ton of money. Um, it wasn't the people that needed, it, but the government was spraying money around, but it just, it shows like, that there's really very little, you know, thought into, into how this goes. They're just pumping money out there and the people that know how to, you know, know the system like that they're the ones that benefit from it one of the one of the consequences of the um breakdown in the supply chain is further concentration of market power in the big guys and this this has happened again and again uh because of lockdowns because you know one one of the ways you work around the lockdown is you you hire a really awesome firm in washington to make sure that that you get a carve out or you get that PPP loan or whatever it is. Um, and the big guys like Amazon bought a bunch of jets, so what 747s or the big ones, whatever those are, um, in anticipation of supply chain crisis. So they, they have the juice, um, the economic power, not, I'm not even talking about political power, to work around the fact that they can't get good ship to where they want. But Mom and pop businesses are not going to buy a jet to make sure that their goods get to their shelves. And so, as has happened this entire time, the rich are getting richer. Um, but the you know the Amazons of the world are benefiting at the expense of what used to be a far more distributed um, process of of satisfying consumer demand. and And I don't know how you get out of that. Like once you've broken it, um, you know, do we just have this big cartel of, of businesses that, that pander to the government and, and in turn are controlled by the government? I don't know. No. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if you know her. She'd be a good guest on your show someday. Carol Roth just wrote a book, The War on Small Business. Um, and I, I interviewed her a few months ago and she's super smart and, and, and savvy. Um, but her whole point is that there's basically two economies. Um, you have it, one very small economy made up of corporations in the, we're talking, I don't know, 10 or 20,000, not, not, not that many. Then you have the other half of the economy of small business and then you got like 30 million. Um, and, and what had happened is like the government can control that, that, that one half of the, the bigger corporations. Um, and they can, they do so pretty effectively. The small business community, they really can't. Um, and the, the thesis of her book is that that played into this war on small business, that it was, almost almost intentional like like it, this was like something to to crush small business i don't know if i'm that cynical but i will say this it allowed the lo the lockdowns to go on much longer because the people um that were making the decisions and the people in that one half of the economy of the corporations they were doing okay like they if you look at the, the stock price of google or amazon or target or costco stocks doing really good um you know like they basically a lot of their competition was was sidelined by by lockdowns their market you know cap grew um and so i think it made it easier for them to say look let's stay home stay safe because they were get they were doing well throughout this um i think if 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 they were feeling the same pain as the other half of the economy and in, in, in so many workers i think we wouldn't have you know stayed in this quite as long as we did yeah it's kind of it, it's some form of regulatory capture that none of us would have anticipated because I, I never would have imagined that lockdowns were a sustainable public policy. Um, I, I thought that this surely creates so much pain, but you have that, um, and I start to sound like a lefty sometimes, you have this collusion of insiders, uh, the crony capitalists that are that are playing the system, and it's it's some combination of regulatory capture, which is you know creating rules where the, your small startup competitors can't enter the market, or political capture, where if you are um, Amazon, you gotta you gotta kiss the ring once in a while, 
and you got to make sure that the, the chairman of, of the committee of jurisdiction um, doesn't decide that you're the enemy. Um, so they, they play ball and it's some combination of that, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a death spiral for everyday Americans. Yeah. And I don't think it makes you sound like a lefty. It really, I mean, it's, it's what it, it's just, just the truth. Like big, big, big government and big corporations kind of teamed up and uh, looked after each other um, throughout this, this event. Um, And I, I think they, maybe were they unaware? I don't know. I think they were just happy to kind of, you know, roll the things that, that they were. And they could actually, like, look, you know, altruistic while they were doing it. Like, they could make it sound like, oh, this is for your own good. And they could run those commercials about stay home, stay stay safe, um, and all the while kind of enriching themselves while they were doing it. Yeah. Uh, which which brings me to something I read this morning, an article in, in Business Insider Um, went out of its way to point out that while Joe Biden is trying to fix the supply chain problem, this isn't a government-created problem. It is a um, problem with the market. Um, And and that's going to be the mantra moving forward, that, that people aren't going to blame all of the decisions that politicians made that got us to this point. They're going to blame the inability of the market to sort of adjust and price gouging and and um, all of that stuff. Um, how do we combat that? Because that's inevitable, right? The market's failing. The market's failing. Um, we need more government to fix it. No, that's a great question. And I kind of saw the, the writing on the wall, like when, when, when Biden gave that uh, speech about the, the unions and the ports that they're trying to, to get to work around the clock, he said the private sector needs, needs to step up. And it really got under my skin, like that, that, he, would, that he would say that. But you're right that that is where the political dialogue is shifting. Um, and as far as, you know, how do we combat that? I think it's doing the, the stuff we're already doing, pointing out that these are government, these are government problems. We can use history to show that and, and, and the literature to show that. Um, but there's some truth on like, we're kind of outgunned. Like it's, it's discouraging sometimes like on Twitter, right? Like if I have a good tweet go like, oh, it's retweeted a hundred times or that's got a thousand likes. And then you see like what, you know, like the blue check marks have like, uh, like, the Marxist professor over here is, you know, has a hundred times that. Um, but I think it's just, just, you know, getting the message out, you know, and, and, and I still think people are, yeah, Americans are, 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 they're not, they're not dumb. They, they, they can see what's going on here. Um, when they're presented with the information, I think they're going to kind of, um, they're not oblivious to the last 18 months and, and, and how we got here. Um, and you know, I think my, not to go down the political road, I think it, it, it's going to be a really tough, uh, 2022 is going to be a tough year. I, I think we're going to get back to what libertarians like gridlock. <laughs> gridlock is good. Um, historically, if you look like when you, you have different, um, you know, the, the president, it, when he's dealing with either a Congress that split or, you know, one that is, is not his party it really solves a lot of problems. And whether it's a Republican in the office or a Democrat, um, gridlock is good and it can bring some of this back. Um, but, but you know, the, the problems are there. These problems, you can't ramp up spending like this. Um, like these, these problems aren't going away anytime soon. And, and they're serious problems. Yeah. I mean, the, and there's, there's no way, there's no like unpainful way to get out of um, this inflationary binge. You, you just created all that money out of thin air. Uh, but gridlock would sort of, my only advice on the supply chain is get out of the way and, and let the market sort it out. And along the way, we might discover all of these crazy union contracts in L.A., or we might um, discover that the Jones Act is, is creating incredible um, extra costs on shipping and, and a thousand other things that we've done. It doesn't seem like, I, I sort of hope that like when we sort of, temporarily suspend some regulation, like, like, let's say, like expedited FDA approval process. Um, the lesson should have been, well, why was, why was that onerous process there in the first place? If we all agreed that there was a health crisis that needed to be solved, um, would we learn a lesson from that? I don't, I don't know if we will. Hopefully some of these, that's your point, that hopefully some of these things can stay rolled back. 
especially now, like it's more important than ever. Um, and the, the good thing is, I think the Biden administration is well aware of the challenges they face. So um, and, and they, you know, say what you will about the administration, but they do have some, you know, minds in, in there that, that get economics. Um, and I, I think regardless of the, re- the rhetoric, my hope is that they are going to do what they need to do and, and get out of the way. So let's let's uh, take a step back. Um, and and I noticed that you have a pension for quoting a lot of the same debt economists that I love to quote. Um, for better or worse, we do that. But how did you how did you find Austrian economics and classical liberalism? What's your what's your backstory? I think that my, I, I wrote this in an article. I think that we just published today. Like the first author that really made an impression on me was wasn't a, an Austrian. It was, it was Thomas Sowell. Um, and it was a book I picked up. It was probably close to 20 years ago now. Um, not quite 20, but close. And it was basic economics. And my dad got it for me. And Sol was the first author that was an economist that I read. And I'm like, oh, like he, he's, a, he's a storyteller. Like there's not many economists that write well, in my, my opinion. Like there's some. I think Henry Hazlitt, the old fee founder, like was one. Henry Hazlitt was a good writer. And he was a writer first and an, an economist second, kind of. Like he went, he wrote for every major newspaper i swear in you know every major publication of his day it seemed like um and and soul is, is like that he he tells story really well i think he's less literary than hazlitt but he tells story just as effectively um and he made he, i understood what he was saying and it was all about incentives and it was all about these things that you know like my introduction to um economics was much worse like i i took a macro class that i hated and didn't really understand as like a freshman. Um, and I'm like, oh, this this I like. And from there, you know, I, I think I, I started to read some Hayek. And and then at once I joined Fee, it was sort of like you just got baptized in all these other minds. And and I'm still learning. You know, like there's guys um, at, at Fee, most of the guys are, have a, a broader and deeper well of knowledge than I do. Um, but I, I love, I, I'm getting there. Like I'm reading now Anatomy of the State. And, and um these are epiphanies you get. Like Rothbard's book is like, okay, what is the state? We're going to ask what this question. We're going to say what first. What what what's not the state? And it, you know, and he says it's not us. So let's look at what 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 characteristics. Is, is that what Jack from Twitter is reading? Is that the it one? It is. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I like we were all excited about that. And I shared it with some people. Like, oh, he's not gonna. He he's lost. You know. Like I'm like I'm just excited that that he's has this sort of intellectual kindling there that he's looking at some of these things yeah um and you know like the, the ideas there like we have to look what, what what is the state what is its purpose um and like like rothbard just says the state is that it's an institution that wants to just keep a monopoly on force yeah. on violence um and it's a very distilled definition but but, but it's true like the, the states that only the only organ in society that can sort of circumvent the ethics and rules that, that bind us. Um, and then once you establish that, they say, well, why do they do this? Um, and I think a lot of people say, well, it's to build a better world for everyone. But is that really what politicians do? Like, like ask yourself, like, look at the politicians you know. Are they really always pursuing some greater good? Or, or are they just like us? Like, yeah. they're, they're kind of moved by, by personal incentives. And are they kind of, like, looking for, for personal power in, in these things? Um and once you arrive at these questions, I, I think it becomes, you know, just kind of crystal clear that, you know, to go back to, to Bastiat, who you're, you're talking about earlier, um, what what is the purpose of the law? Uh, the purpose of the law, it, it needs to be to protect us from plunder. Like, like say, no, you can't take his stuff and you can't take my stuff and you can't violate their their rights or, or, or their labor. You can't. And when I say labor, like, you know, Bastiat was writing sh- shortly before... Um, the Civil War, you know, I, I say shortly, it was, it was, it was, you know, more than a decade, but he, he took a very firm stance on slavery and he saw this is the, the root of their conflict because they're using plunder in, in a way that they're should, they're, they're, they're perverting the law. And he said, when you pervert the law, it creates all this discord, this political discord. Um, and, and he was, you know, he, I think kind of foresaw what was going to happen with the, with the civil war. And it was because they were using the law and purposes. It, it, it wasn't intended. Um, and, and so now like if you create the, you know, the law to protect us from plunder, the great evil is when the thing that you create, it starts to do the plunder. And that's where we are now. Like, um, in, he said, there's two reasons for it. Like one, people are greedy. 
Um, but the other is this, this idea that, oh, we're, we're using it for good. And, and that's what we're being sold today. Like, oh, we're plundering from you, but it's for your good. We're doing all these things over here that are good. And Rothbard talks about this. He, he, he says, like, the, the state itself, like, most, so much of their creation is, is, is trying to, t- you know, show people that we're, we're doing this. But we're, it's, it's not just um, good. It's actually necessary. If we're not here, everything is going to fall apart. Um, but the truth is, like, we don't really need the state beyond a very, you know, I think I think most, uh, you and I at least would agree, and a lot of people would agree with us, 95% of what the federal government does, you could whack off and and just lop it right off. And, and the, 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 not only would we not, wouldn't there be a collapse, we'd be better off for it. Yeah. And then we could argue about the other 5%. Yeah. 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 I'll start with just 95% and then we can whittle down. Yeah, I feel like we can find common ground with that 95%. Um, You know, uh, thinking about uh, Fee and your founder, Leonard Reed, um, the older I get, the more I appreciate his strategy, which I always thought uh, when I was younger was too passive. He, He just wanted to put those ideas out there. And he was a, he was a great storyteller as well, and you know he wasn't he wasn't looking to convert or recruit or build an army. He just wanted to put it out there, and if you found it, um, you know that was a that was a light that would go off, and and who knows what would happen when you found those those ideas and those values that that suddenly made the world make sense. But I I think in a lot of ways is having been involved in politics and all sorts of things in my career, I'm now at a place where, you know what, Leonard Reader's right. The best we can do, and probably the most respectful way to spread ideas and values is to, is to let people get there for themselves. And I think, I think that's kind of, you know, he's got that whole thing about the light, which I, if I tried to retell that story, I would butcher it. But um, I think Leonard Reed was right. Uh, you know, I, I've read Leonard Reed less than like Hazlitt and, and some of the others, um, but boy, the, you're right. The, the man could tell a story, and in like he has all these moments. Like it, I'll, I'll read an essay, and um, one that I, 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 you know, I think I cited in an article recently. Just a simple point that don't no don't, don't focus on ends. Everybody wants to focus on ends. Focus on the means that you use to do something, because if your means are vile, if they're rotten. Um, the ends, the ends are going to be eventually as well too. Um, and in, in his approach is kind of like mine. Like I, I consider myself just kind of an evangelist for liberty, right? Like I, I believe these ideas to my core. I think they're good. I want other, you know, when I think it's human nature. When you have something good, you want to share it. But ultimately, I can't really, you know, I put the ideas out there, help people, um, you know, maybe see what you're seeing. And I, I read an email today I got from a gentleman um, on an article I wrote. I think it was one I wrote a little while back, but he I think we just reposted it. And it, it just warmed my heart because he said, like he just talked about the epiphany it created in his mind and how excited, and it, like that mind, that's what I'm trying to do. Like you find those, those minds where people have like sort of, it, it clicks for them. And one reader that you, you break through with, like that's, that's somebody that you got, you know, that gets me more excited than if you got an article that, oh, that one did really well. Just one note from a reader that just says like, wow, that I'd never thought of it this way before. Um, that's the kind of progress that I, uh, it, it just makes me feel good. And, and so like uh, I tell people like I respond to all, you know, every email and uh, I, I thank them because it does, it, it makes what I do. Um, it, it'd be a lot harder. Um, you know, cause sometimes you're in the same business. Sometimes it feels like we're, we're banging our head against the wall that, that Liberty, Liberty's in retreat, but to, to go circle back with Leonard Reed, you know, when he, when he started fee much darker time, right? right. Like it was Liberty was really at, you know, looked like the, the flame was about to go out then. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like, I think that context is important. Like, yeah, like right now, Liberty feels like it's on the ropes a little bit. It's seen much darker days. Yeah. So what uh, what article or project are you most proud of? What was most successful, what resonated? Um, I, I think, you know, like going back to when we started writing about this stuff in March of last year, um, the pandemic has been a, it's been hell, you know, for everyone. Like nobody has liked this. Um, but I think we covered this in a way I'm really proud of. We took a we took a firm stance early and said that no, we were going to talk about it. We're going to write about it. We're going to explore it. 
and in many ways, like I said, it was, it was, it was tailor made for the lessons that we have at fee. And we reached a ton of people doing it. Like yeah. we really did. Like we had last year was our biggest traffic record ever it, as far as web traffic. And it wasn't close. Yeah. And, um, that was like, you, you, you feel like you're, um, as bad as what we're going through is you're kind of at the front lines, you know, making the case. Um, and, and in some ways we didn't win because like the lockdowns went on way too long, mm-hmm. but history is going to show we were right about this. And I, I, I'm, I'm just confident that eventually they're going to look back. Okay. Lockdowns were a really bad idea. And these vaccine mandates for one, I don't think they're ever going to get off the ground in the way that some people hope they will. Um, I think we, you know, that, that makes me most proud. We covered this effectively um, and when you see, like, sometimes our own articles did well, but you'll see, you know, something I wrote, like there was Bill Maher did an episode and I'm like, oh, that he, they read my piece. I know they did because they took two different, different studies. And I'm like that we're, our ideas are getting out there and they're shaping even a, a broader, um, you know, getting broader media appeal. Um, and you know, like our ideas are good and we, we need to, um, like I said, they're on the ropes a little bit right now, but um, I think we're, we're kind of at the threshold where, where a lot of there, 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 a shift is happening. Yeah. I'd, like I've talked about this a lot, uh, you know, my disappointment in a lot of uh, D.C. libertarians, classical liberals, constitutional conservatives, whatever you want to call them. Um, they have a lot of these groups haven't stepped up during lockdowns. And, and to me, the the most important thing we could do is step up when everyone's a little bit afraid to step up, um, to, to speak a little bit of uncomfortable truth when everybody wants to sort of cower in fear. And I had Rand Paul on a couple weeks ago and he was, without naming names, he was complaining about that. But I, I, I would give a shout out to the Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, we at Free the People really shifted what we were doing to answer this call, um, you mentioned Jeffrey at, at Brownstone Institute, AIER. Um, uh, Tom Woods has done a lot on this. And and after that, I'm sort of running out of, uh, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody important, but um, it's not it's not necessarily the, the libertarian industrial complex that you would hope would have been sort of unified moving forward. We're gonna, we're gonna fight, which will surely be not just a an assault on liberty, but a humanitarian crisis. And and I, I was proud of you guys, but I was also disappointed that there weren't more organizations like yours that stepped up. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. Um, I, and I think it is especially like these sort of more like the DC groups, right? Like like they um, and the, the, they're they're well funded. They have these great minds, and and it's not universal. Like I think there's individuals within those organizations, but but I'm with you. Like this was we. To me, this is pretty easy stuff. Like these are these are violating all the principles we hold hold dear. Um, and and you, you mentioned Jeffrey Tucker. I want to give him a shout out too because I, I correspond just a little with Jeffrey. I've never met him, but I, I told him um, I think one of the things that kind of galvanized me and um, me personally was just seeing like on Twitter him taking some of the things he said early. And um, I think we needed everybody was kind of looking and saying like, okay, how, what can we say about this? How do we cover this? And he was like somebody I saw like, oh, he, he, he's having none of this. And that kind of, I think, gave me a little bit more courage. And, and you know, and that's just speaking for myself. Um, and, you know, so we just talked internally, like, like, how do we, how do we cover this? And I think everybody's on the same page. Like these are, um, th- there's no purpose. Like th- th- this is not, the government doesn't have the right to be doing this. Um, and it, uh, but, but getting there, you know, it, it, it wasn't, it was kind of dreamlike, right? At first, like, how is this happening? And then, like I said, like, partly like, are we going to get, are we going to get kicked off Facebook for saying something like this? Are we going to get kicked off? Um, and we never did. Like, I, I, I think one thing they might've gave us a warning for on something, um, uh, I wrote on, on a study that you probably know the study, the one that came out of Denmark on mass mandates and, and the study basically said like, well, th- th- we don't really, it, as far as um, reducing people, the, the spread of COVID, like it, it, it made it look like the mass mandate wasn't very effective. And I, I cribbed almost entirely from the New York, uh, when I say cribbed, I, I, I cited them, um, but I framed it just like the New York Times. But at the time, like there was that big debate going on over, over masks. 
and uh, and they like they said well you know they gave us like a, a bit of a warning there but it, um that was that was about it um but the censorship thing was it, it weighed on me a lot and i think all of us right like you kind of we're, we're feeling out those boundaries on twitter or like what what can i say and you got to be careful um and um that that's unfortunate in itself that's a whole other topic but that if you if you have a wrong take on on social media like suddenly your account could be disappeared right right so i have, I have a theory on this and we'll wrap up on this because it's it's kind of half-baked and, and maybe you can fix it but there's there's a public choice explanation for this iron triangle of of the NIH and the NAAID and all of like there's 23 different sub agencies and they shower um, the medical research community with uh, probably a majority of their fund but certainly at the margin it's it's that wedge funding that gives them an insane amount of control over let's say pharmaceutical companies medical research institutions and that kind of thing. Uh, you have pharmaceutical companies that have somehow managed to convince the government to mandate that people consume their product, and they're making bank on that product, the vaccines. And then you have social media companies whose clients, their advertising clients, are surely primarily um, government, which spent like they're spending billions of dollars on advertising the their mantra on lockdowns, on masking, on vaccines, whatever it is. Um, so between the three of these, I, I feel like it sort of explains why there is no dissent from, um, uh, no dissent allowed on, on science, on, on questions of that. And, and we're all being censored because, you know, they're, they're not making money because the social media co companies aren't making money because of what fee does. They're making money because they have these big corporate clients that happen to be pharmaceutical companies. Does that make me sound like a tinfoil hat crazy? I, I don't think so. Like, like this is sort of like, hey, economics is all about incentives, right? Um, and th there was, you know, to your to your point, did you happen to see that uh, mashup of? Uh, it was going a video going on on Twitter, and all of the newscasts begin brought to you by Pfizer. Yeah, brought to you by Pfizer. Um, of course, that makes a difference, and I, I, I'd be stunned if, if people would say, "Oh no, that doesn't that doesn't matter." If your biggest, you know, advertising partner is Pfizer, um, Pfizer, hey, like they're, they're going to have some influence in in, in these things. And um, I also think just the the for whatever reason, I had a, I had a discussion with this recently. A friend who's in media writes for a major paper, um, one of the biggest there is, and it, we were talking about how media, for whatever reason. Are more afraid of this virus than anyone else, um, and like part of me always thought like maybe are they is it like a virtue signal thing? I think they're just more generally genuinely afraid of the virus. And I don't know why. Um, maybe because they they read more literature that you know scary literature. I maybe it's because just their per, the personalities that make them up. Um, but so I, I do think a lot of these reporters just are more afraid of the virus, and they have. You know their 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 political leanings are, are lend themselves more towards authoritarian solutions. Yeah, yeah. Um, of the virus is bad. We need to use the state to fix it. And they don't do back to the laptop class, and they don't have to bear the personal costs of of their fear or ideology or whatever it is. I actually sat next to a reporter, a DC reporter, on a plane down to Miami, and it was the first time he'd been on a plane in the last whatever it's been now, fifteen months. And I'm like, wow, that that's cool if you can do that. I made um, this. That would be horrible, I think. I, I made, you know, your, your point about how people are personally affected, I think is a really good one. I know business owners um, that were kind of sympathetic to lockdowns, but their business wasn't closed. Um, and they love their business. It's their life. But if they had been closed... I think their take would have been very different because it's their baby. It's it's the thing that pours all of their energy, you know, goes into that. And if they would have been, you know, um, told, nope, you're shut down, and you know, we're don't we don't know when it's going to be lifted. I really think their their take on these things would have been very different. Um, and so, like as far as the reporter class goes, they're still going out. They're they're essential workers. Um, they're still collecting their checks. Um, and they're covering this, which is getting all this attention and news. It's important. I'm sure that had that factors in there somewhere. I don't know where, but it, it, it's part of it. So, how do people find you and Fee um, 
to, to consume this awesome content? Fee, you know, very easy, fee.org. And, you know, all of our articles are up over there. Um, I, I, you know, I'm on uh, Twitter more than I, you know, should be now. Like my, my handle, I think, is Miltimore79. And I, you know, come on. I, I like to talk with people. I, like my audience is, you know, Brad Palumbo has been kind enough to kind of navigate me on giving me good tw- t- Twitter tips. So I've been able to, you know, grow my presence there. And I just like, you know, talking in, with people that read our stuff. Um, and, you know, like, but Twitter, you're on it a lot, too. It is like one of those things I wish I could quit. Like I'm on there too much. Um, maybe there's a happy median in there, but it, it is a great place to hang out for finding what's happening. It's, I mean, it's, it's part of our business and I, I think it's okay. Um, you just, you can't take, um, the haters personally, you just ignore them. And if you don't feed the trolls, they go away eventually. Surprisingly, I've had very, you know, little hate. Uh, although it, I was explaining last night, um, I, I was attacked three times, once by libertarians, once by conservatives. And once by uh, progressives, and and when that happens, like you're like, oh boy, I I really made some people mad here, yeah. And that's when I just turn my phone off and walk away. And I respond a couple, but you're like, okay, there's too many here to respond to. Um, and, and my one with libertarians, basically, I was just saying it was when Don Rumsfeld died, and there was a lot of people cheering Rumsfeld's death, and they weren't. I wasn't even going after libertarians. I think I made the people I saw were were progressives. And they were really excited. And, and I said, you know what? It, it, I just don't like that. I don't care who you are. Like when people die spiking the football and doing all that, I don't like. But some libertarians really took issue with the fact that, you know, um, I, in their opinion, was sticking up for Rumsfeld. Um, and though I think part of the reason I did it, I was in an elevator with Rumsfeld once years ago when I was out here. And I, he was a very kind guy. And he always had this grandfatherly thing. He was wrong about all kinds of stuff about the war. But I just don't like, you know, again, whoever, when you, when you died, like give that stuff a little, now is not the time to do it. But I, and I, here's the other thing I, not to go on, but um, I think at the time, libertarians really fought that Iraq war. And, and I was kind of not, I wasn't really a libertarian yet. I was just a war skeptic. But um, I, I, I get why they still harbor a lot of feelings and probably don't like Rumsfeld. Yeah. Well, I, I try not to say anything that I'll regret on Twitter. And, and I've, I've never deleted a tweet. And I'm sure there's some stupid things that I've said. But, but I feel like uh, we should be responsible for creating a civil conversation, even if Twitter's not necessarily a place to do that. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. And I, I mostly succeed. Sometimes I can be a little too sarcastic and I got to kind of be careful, like um, not to be too glib and, and things like that. But because you're right, civil discourse, we need it more than ever. And there's not a lot of it on Twitter. Yeah, unlike that Brad Palumbo guy. Yeah, oh, he's trouble. Yeah, he's horrible. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> you get no chance to respond to that. <laughs> that was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty. Honest conversations with interesting people.